Awesome. So I think we'll get started. And as people come in, they'll just join in and catch up. Um, so I'd love for us to start off with some introductions. I'll introduce myself first. Um, my name is Benet Hershon, and I'm the outreach coordinator um, at CCCD. Um, and Amanda, did you want to introduce yourself? Sure thing. Um, my name is Amanda Littleton. I manage the conservation district. I work with Benet, and um, we're really excited to talk to you tonight about the Conservation Opportunity Fund. So if you're able to turn off your camera or your microphone, whatever one you're comfortable with, um, I'd love for us to go around and just share our names, um, what town we're in, um, why you're interested in this opportunity, and also um, how you heard about it. So if anyone is eager on getting us started, you can feel free to unmute and jump in. I'll, I'll start today. I'm Andy Bohannon, Parks Recreation facilities director for the city of Keene. And um, I, I know about the opportunity because I always miss it every year. And this year I said, I'm not gonna miss it. So um, I got the email and I said, I better do it this time because January, who knows, but I do have uh, some folks from the Friends of Ashville at River Park um, that will be attending the January 4th one as well as we've been trying to do a lot of pollinator gardens there. So. Um, just thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Well, my name is Michelle Chalice, and I am an environmental landscape designer with Healthy Home Habitats. And I have had two clients uh, speak with me about potentially helping them go through the process. So uh, while I'm not exactly clear where they are at or how that's going to go, I thought I'd become more familiar so that I have that possibility. That's awesome. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dee Robbins. I think I'm 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 not visual. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm with the United Church of Christ in Keene, downtown Keene. And um we we are hoping to get a grant and we want to create a pollinator demonstration pollinator garden um in the church park that's uh pocket park behind our church. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. So is it my turn? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. I, I was busy. I just showed up. So um, I'm Georgina Carley, and we are transforming approximately four to five acres. We own two pieces of adjoining property. And the goal is to have a botanical garden that people can come and see how to do their formerly traditional plantings so that they don't maybe look quite so messy as they think they're going to look. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm uh... I'm Bob Hanlon. Um, my sister and I uh, own about 16 acres in Fitzwilliam that we were both born on. And uh, it's time to do something with it. So uh, I'm here getting some information. Someone sent me an email that I picked up last night and uh, said, hmm, let's find out. Great. Thanks so much for joining us. And I'm not sure if if we missed anyone else, any more introductions? Okay, great. Well, you guys can feel free to introduce yourself in the chat as we go on through the slides, um, but we'll, we'll keep going on with the presentation. <laughs> Um, so just an overview of the Conservation Opportunity Fund. Um, so the mission of the fund is to provide funding for owners of small tracts of land um, who are interested in improving wildlife habitat on their property. Um, so the way the fund works is that um, the fund will reimburse the project costs up to $1,500. Um, so if you know you're, you were to go through the application process and be awarded the grant, um, you would just have to be aware that um, you would be responsible for the upfront costs and then would um, submit you know, all the paperwork and required receipts for reimbursement. Um, 
And also like the planning, design, and installation of your project um, is really the responsibility of you or any contractor that you may hire for the installation or consultation. Um, so CCCD staff, so Amanda and I, we're here to help um, and provide technical assistance, um, you know, answer any questions, share resources that we think may be helpful, but we're not here to design um, or install the projects. Um, even though we love being outside, um, we just don't have the time or the capacity to do so. Um, so just wanted to make that clear. Um, and yeah, let's move on to the next slide. Um, so just we'll go over eligibility for the fund. Um, so you have to be a private landowner in Cheshire County um, or a land user um, with site security. So this could be a long-term lease, for example. Um, to qualify for the fund, um, you have to have a tract of land that's 25 acres or less. Um, and this includes individuals, businesses, organizations, um, farmers and forest land owners are all encouraged to apply. And I'm just gonna go through a few um, different ideas of eligible projects that we've done in the past. Um, so one example um, would be the installation of native pollinator habitat. So this is really planting uh, native vegetation uh, to provide nectar and pollen sources, um, as well as offering a low disturbance area for nesting and egg laying. So these are just a few examples of um, what this could look like. It could be, you know, the conversion of um, a really larger lawn area to pollinator habitat. Um, and in this example photo, there's also some really nice educational signage. So you have the component of the pollinator habitat tied into really the education and outreach, um, which is also a great thing. Um, and then on the image on the um, right hand side of the screen, um, you'll see more of a smaller pollinator habitat plot. So these are just some examples um, through the application process of ideas that you could look to um, when you're thinking of what you wanna do with your project. Um, another example um, of a great eligible project would be a rain garden. Um, so a rain garden are depressed areas of a landscape that collect rainwater from a roof, a driveway, or a street, and it allows the water to soak into the ground. Um, they're planted with native perennials and shrubs um, and are really crucial in managing stormwater runoff and improving water quality. Um, so this year, we actually have a really exciting new partnership with Soak Up the Rain New Hampshire um, through the Department of Environmental Services. And um, Soak Up the Rain New Hampshire really focuses on sharing resources uh, for rain garden planning. Um, and so we have this new partnership um, where if you go on the website, um, which we'll have a link at the end of the presentation too, um, you can fill out an interest form if a rain garden is of interest and um, we'll get in touch with you and connect you um, with uh, the folks at Soak Up the Rain. Um, we have been doing um, some visits to help uh, people figure out where a good, you know, part of their lawn would be or part of their property to place the rain garden. Um, and they could also help with sharing resources on, you know, certain plants that might be a good fit for the rain garden. Um, so that's a great resource. We might be slowing down some of those technical assistance visits uh, with the weather um, getting pretty cold, um, but, uh, you know, certainly, don't let the weather stop you from filling out that form. Uh, we're happy to stop by um, and also happy to, you know, do a consultation call over Zoom um, or over the phone or to postpone it further in the year when the weather um, is nicer. Um, and this is a really great opportunity to help create a compelling proposal. Um, we're, you know, we're stopping by and we're really um, helping you kind of put the pieces together. So when you know, we'll talk a little bit more about the application process, but this could really help uh, in a lot of ways with it. Um, so another example of an eligible project would be the creation or maintenance of early successional habitat. Um, so, you know, this would be a project more likely on, I'm guessing, a, a larger property. Um, so this is when uh, you kind of have that combination of old fields, shrublands, and young forests um, as a habitat. And you can kind of see in the graphic um, how the area would be broken up. Um, and these are increasingly uncommon um, on the New Hampshire landscape right now um, as, you know, development. Um, 
kind of takes over the landscape and it's a really important thing for a diversity of wildlife. So this type of project uh, might be great for someone who has um, kind of an area that looks like this on their property or wants to have an, you know, really kind of make it into a, I guess, uh, a really intentional early successional habitat. Um, and I, I think it's a really uh, great thing uh, especially with um, it being so increasingly uncommon. Um, so another example of an eligible project um, would be the creation of a vegetated buffer on surface waters. So this could be, for example, if your property borders a lake, a stream, um, and this um, you know, is when you would plant native trees, shrubs, and perennials, and it reduces erosion and improves water quality. Um, it also creates, you know, native habitat um, and food sources uh, for native species. Um, so that's another possibility for an eligible project. Um, and, you know, kind of to tie in th these native plantings, um, we've seen a lot of projects with conversions of lawns or fields to native plant gardens. Um, and a lot of people, I think, kind of can get scared away from this um, when they think of kind of just letting their lawn um, just kind of go wild. Um, but there's a way to really make this um, a thoughtful project and uh, to be really beautiful and to really benefit uh, native pollinators in your area. Um, so I'm going to pass it on to Amanda. Great. Thanks, Danae. Um, so what are we giving priority to? Well, first thing, it sounds simple, but following application guidelines. It just helps the reviewers to, like to, if you answer the questions in the order that they're given, just to be a stronger application and they really appreciate it. But this next one is, this next bullet's really the most important one, I think. Having a detailed plan for site preparation, long-term maintenance, and sustainability. What we found for with a lot of applications um, that hadn't scored well with the reviewers was that they just didn't have a clear idea of what was needed to prepare the site for planting to ensure it would be successful. Um, and this depends on what you're doing. But for example, if you're seeding something down with seeds, um, site preparation is vital for a pollinator habitat. And so we, we do have some resources on our website for organic site preparation options um, that are available for seeding down pollinator habitats. Um, and then also if you're planting plugs or potted plants, site preparation can also um, be important, but a little less so. But we also just wanted to sort of better understand, you know, sort of your commitment to the long-term sustainability of the investment on your property. Um, inputs of landowner time and resources. So being able to show that um, this grant is gonna be leveraging sort of your own efforts that you're gonna be putting on your property is an excellent thing to include in the application. Um, make, making sure that the, um, that the that what you're proposing is informed by the ecology of our region. And so really we're just, we're looking for native um, plant species here. That's that's the big takeaway. Um, and, and, and we can get into that a little bit more, but like when we're thinking about native plants for pollinator habitat, for example, you want to make sure you have things that are blooming all season long um, to provide that forage uh, as well as habitat for, for the pollinators. Um, Providing opportunities to partner with the district to offer community education. This, this is one of the things that's been a little intimidating as well for people, I think, in the past, but something that the reviewers love to see, because one of our goals for this project is to have peer-to-peer -peer education. We really want people to be able to install these different habitat improvements for biodiversity in the region, and then share it with their neighbors, be able to help learn from each other about what's working well, how, how you did it, um, how you would change it if you did it again in the future, anything like that. And so there's lots of ways that we can work with you to help do some of that education, um, whether it's like a guest blog on our newsletter and our website, or even doing a workshop for a pollinator tour around a neighborhood. Um, all right, so I'll go to the next slide. So what's not eligible? Um, one thing that we found that we really are trying to dissuade people from doing is, in, is applying for projects that have already been started. 
Um, we really want to be able to meet with you, take a look at your site, help provide you with feedback on how to do the site prep, provide some tips, you know, um, and make sure that it, it's just really successful. We just want to see your project be as successful as possible. Um, and so we encourage folks to apply and plan, but not get started um, until you're selected for funding and we can have a site visit with you and get you all the resources that you may need to be successful. So next one, um, projects from successful grantees from um, past years, you can't apply again. If we were funded last year, we're encouraging people to wait a couple of years before they're apply again, because we wanna be able to share, share this opportunity with as many people as possible. Um, and what are we not able to fund? Um, we're really not able to fund landowner time or any research or feasibility study. Any efforts that are not going to lead to sort of an on the ground improved wildlife habitat um, practice. And so um, what we do love to fund is plant materials and soil amendments. So we really want to see sort of that on the ground um, activity for your work. All right. So, but I mentioned this earlier, awards are up to $1,500 per project per landowner. Um, they're paid as a reimbursement upon completion of the project. The grantee submits a request for reimbursements along with the final report. And this includes copies of any invoices and receipts. Um, we've had, we, we don't want the, we don't want the outlay of $1,500 to, um, to be a deterrent from applying and participating in this. And so we, we will work with folks who are interested in participating um, to um, not, not wait until the final report to get their $1,500. Like if you wanna do, um, uh, you know, go so far, do some work, um, collect all the invoices and submit them, we can um, reimburse you sort of as you go throughout the project, but it is, it is based on reimbursements because we need to be able to see that some activity is happening to be able to move forward. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions about that too later as we go on with any of these items. Um, grant, grantees are asked to submit record of the time and the money that they spent on it because we're just excited to sort of see like how, how does it work for these landowners, like for landowners who are doing this, like is it leveraging other activities, other dollars that are going into the property. All right. So here's the timeline. Um, we've been trying to publicize this since the beginning of November. Um, and they're due on February 1st. This is a little earlier than in the past because we heard from um, our awardees in the past when it was, they were um, due later is that by the time they found out plant materials weren't available because I know a lot of these native plants, they sell out and the way people have been gardening through the pandemic, which is great, um, plant materials are really limited. So we moved that up a little this year. So we'll be able to notify you if you've been selected for funding by mid-March. Um, and we're encouraging folks to um, try to, to plan projects that you can do in one growing season. So if you can you know, know that you're funded in March, you can start to consider purchasing your plant materials, doing any site preparation that may be needed. Um, for example, if you're you know, tarping an area to be able to seed it down and plant it in the fall, you'd want to get that started in the spring. So we want to make sure you have that full growing season to be able to do this. And um, we have worked with people for extensions, though, if, if they, there's a legitimate reason if you need an extra year for site prep or anything like that. So there's flexibility built into all of this. All right, next one. All right, so what do we have included in the project? I don't know if you've taken a look at our website, there's um, a request for proposals that really defines the, what we're looking for. And then there's an application template for you. So we have a narrative and we'll get into that in a minute with some example questions that are on there. Um, then we asked you to create a budget. And how can you create the best budget possible? Um, call around, do a little homework, look to see how much some of these plants cost so you can have a realistic idea of how large of an area you're able to work on with a planting. Um, as well as for the soil amendments. For example, if you need to bring in certain um, amendments for a rain garden, then you might just wanna be able to call around some of the local businesses to see sort of what you're getting yourself into for the size of an area. 
Um, and then we ask you to do a map and this is just to get a sense of it. You don't have to be a you know GIS specialist here to create a map. You can just do a very simple hand drawn on a piece of paper, take a picture of it or scan it in and send it in with the application. We just want to get a sense of sort of like sometimes a, a visual you know can go a long way to to show us sort of what your property is like and how you can move forward successfully. And then a few pictures of the project site along those same lines just gives us that sense with the map of sort of what your site looks like and um, and how it fits in with the project you're looking to do. All right. So creating a strong proposal. We have lots of resources on our website um, and um, Benet's got that link there and we can drop that in the chat as well. Um, and depending on what type of project you want, you're going to have different resources. But one of the things that we, why we encourage you to wait and not get started until we do a site visit with you and you've been selected for funding is because we really want to work with folks um, to make sure that they have all the resources they need. So we're always happy to help connect you with uh, people to offer you guidance or um, suggest different places to purchase plants or any, any of the above. Um, and then of course, um, give us a call if you're writing your application or um, and you just wanna talk through to make sure that it's a good fit, don't hesitate um, to give us a call. And um, our phone number's here and it's also on the website as well. So this narrative, people get a little hung up on it. It's not meant to be intimidating. We're trying to keep it short, a thousand words maximum. So that's only a couple pages of writing. Um, we just, I just wanted to go over the questions to give you a sense of what we're looking for. So when I say briefly describe your project, it's just a summary snapshot of what are you trying to do? Give us that sort of paragraph of sort of the who, what, when, where, what's happening there. Um, and then the expected outcomes here, it's just like, what are your results? You know, do you expect to have a 500 square feet pollinator garden? Is it gonna be um, 10 acres of early successional habitat? You know, adding some numbers in there, giving us a sense of sort of when, if you are successful with your project, what will this look like for you? And then this third question um, is the activities. It's your work plan. So what are you going to be doing um, in a detailed step-by-step -step process to be able to get those anticipated results that you're looking for. Um, and this just gives us a sense of sort of um, how much understanding that you have about the steps that are needed and where you might need some extra assistance and sort of how we could step in as well. All right. And then that kind of leads us right into that next question. So how can we help you? A lot of times we won't know if you need help unless you ask. So we just wanted to explicitly have you consider like, what are the ways that the district could help your project be as successful as possible? Is it plant recommendations? Um, is it guidance, you know, getting some guidance on where to site a rain garden, anything like that. And then what skills and resources you bring to the table is the fifth question as well. Um, Long-term maintenance and sustainability is the question. And then the last one, the, this is the educational component. We're really excited to brainstorm with people who are excited to offer education because um, that's what this is all about for us is getting habitat on, on, into the landscape, but also sharing with our neighbors on how we can continue to grow our impact. So we're really excited about this seventh question. It's the last question on the narrative and um, it's something that um, we're, we're sort of looking for your ideas and how to um, engage people. All right, and that's it for questions. So maybe we could stop the screen share and open it up to everyone for questions to see if you guys, um, if you have any. Quick question, Amanda, um, related to like the educational component. So, um, if these, if the grant was accepted, uh, would we be looking, or are you looking for particular signage uh, related to um, your program within the, like a public park? Um, it's not necessary, Andy, okay. to have signage. We don't require anything like that. Um, if there's interest on the landowner's behalf, then we would be excited to help you guys design something, you know, to have 
um, some fun graphics, maybe some sort of interpretive language on there that helps folks sort of engage with the work that was done. So we would be excited to explore that opportunity, but certainly not necessary because some of these are in people's backyards and right. they don't they don't want that side of thing. So I think it's a value add if people want to do signage, but not necessary. Would would part of the signage be covered in the grant, or is it all related to the plantings? Oh, that's a great question. We haven't had anybody ask that before. Um, I think as long as the majority of the funding is going to the um, habitat installation itself, because that's really the goal of it, then um, I'm sure we could carve out some money for the signage into the budget as well, because I think there's that real educational value. Could, could there be, um, I, and I know there's this is a reimbursed program, but yeah. is there, uh, could there be matching funds to help uh, with that particular initiative as far as signage? And one of the things we know, um, yeah, Ash Willett River Park, we're definitely um, working with the Friends of Ash Willett River Park to uh, do a lot more of these type of gardens. And we've made a real push this last year to do, um, you know, pollinators, we just planted a ton this fall. Um, and one of our big next steps is uh, education for the community. And so we want to be able to um, highlight that uh, at the same time, still increase our plantings. So um, that's kind of the angle that we're looking for. Um, and I just want to, before I, I explore this further with the advisory committee, um, you know, I think they're going to be all for the application, but uh, just some brainstorming off the top of my head, and perhaps we can brainstorm further. Um, but those are just some of the things I thought of when I was listening to the presentation. Yeah, no, I think I think that would be really great project for this um it even um since you guys have done a lot in the past too if the signage you know as long as it's native plants if we work with you guys to do more installations and then could have signage highlighting the different native plants in multiple garden sites around the area i think that there would there would be a lot of value there um okay. for the community so i think it's i think it's in the right direction it's a little different than our typical grant i will say for the others that are listening that's not the norm usually it's more about doing the installation of plants but with the Ashwillet river park being such a public place and such a wonderful spot i think it would be a lot of exposure for, for people to learn so i think it could be a unique grant in that way great so that's what we're looking to do thank you yeah and I, one of the things that we're, I'll just share, like, like we're trying to be flexible about these because we see that there's opportunities all the time that we wouldn't have thought of on our own. And the idea is about building partnerships with landowners around the community. So we really are eager to sort of hear your ideas like Andy brought to the table and, and, and see how we can grow the program. And I have a question. Um, I was reading the articles you said about site prep. No, no, and it was a report about how the first three years did. I think Jeff did the assessment of it. And one of the recommendations was that it seemed, based on the, the results, was that it was it seemed very helpful to have a professional involved. And I didn't know how important that might be. <laughs> I guess it depends on the project. Uh -huh. um, I'm not sure exactly which one you're referring to. Um, they were the early projects and most of them were seeding, um, seeding pollinator gardens in large sort of farm land areas. Yeah, in those large, in those large areas, it is helpful to have a contractor with the right equipment um, for site prep because there's a lot of work that goes into um, ensuring that the ground is gonna be uh, weed free or at least as little competition of weeds from old pastures and haylands as possible. That's a real challenge. And so having, having somebody with the right equipment is key. I think a lot of the smaller scale, um, if, you're, if you're talking like an acre of pollinator habitat, yeah, you're gonna need some, you're gonna need some help I think with that. But I think a lot of our smaller, more garden focused when you're looking at utilizing plugs or, yeah. or, or potted um, plants, yeah. then oftentimes, you know, 
it, it can be done with a shovel um, and some in some eager helpers. Okay. Uh, so so I, I don't feel like I, I think it just really depends on your scale. Scale. And what we recommend. That's yeah. that's what I was assuming, but I wanted to make sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We, we, we want these to be things people can do on their own um, as well, because that's sort of part of the beauty of a lot of these sort of land conversions, pollinator habitats and rain gardens. They are really accessible for people to have an impact um, on a small piece of property. Hey, can I offer you another resource that might uh, be used for, for uh, just a... Um, UNH Cooperative Extension oftentimes has master gardener programs and they have to volunteer so many hours. Um, this is kind of how we are building, rebuilding Ash Willett River Park um, is we've been able to get, you know, a few of their students who needed that, those volunteer hours and they've been lucky enough to stay on with us. Um, and so that's been a great resource for us. Yeah, thanks, Andy. I, I thought of it and I forgot about it. So that's, yeah. <laughs> that's helpful. Thank you. Welcome. I'll just, I'll just add, I'm glad Andy brought that up in the master gardeners are just signing people up right now for another session of their course. Um, Ruth, their program director just reached out to us today about it. Um, and it's going to be in Southwest New Hampshire and Hancock um, is where they're, so not, not right nearby, but kind of close. Um, and so there might be a new batch of eager students that are going to be looking to do projects in the region. One thing, um, if there's no other questions right now, I'd just like to mention is that if you had ideas of what you think would be an important improvement to wildlife habitat in the region that you didn't see the examples, of when Benet ran through those um, examples of projects that are eligible for funding, we're really always interested to hear what you think we should be offering this for because it's if we don't list it, it doesn't mean it's not eligible. We just want, those are the ones that we've been encouraging because they thought that they would be sort of low hanging fruit and um, uh, easy enough for people to be able to do on their own or with, with a contractor. But we're but we are excited to hear other ideas if folks have any. And if, is there any other any other questions about the process or logistics of applying um, and getting funding? Um. I'm having I'm having a bit of a <laughs> I'm having a bit of a problem just with the where the line is drawn. The you initially said that it it should be a project that hasn't already been started. Yes. Um. So. But yet you you should have a good idea of what you're doing or what you want to do. Uh, <laughs> I'm having a little problem deciding where that line would be. Um, so like I already know what I want to do. I have two areas that I want to put a meadow. Maybe different, different seed mixes, but um, one of them is I think total, I think the total area is about 10,000 square feet. So a little less than a quarter acre. And I've already gotten the tarps. So would that dismiss me from applying? No, so um, I think I, I hear, I think I hear what you're saying. And so I think what you're, you know, if you have the plan in mind that you wanna create pollinator habitat. And, I, from ordered, seed, and I ordered the tarps. So I know this has to be tarped and I and I've studied the process. So I'm I'm wondering if if I guess the best way to put it is am I going to need enough help for you to be interested in my applying for the grant? 
Oh, yeah. So just because you've already purchased the tarps, like if you were applying, I would imagine it would be then to apply for dollars for seeds, right? For seeding. Right. Yeah. Um, and I was and seeding the tarps as well. It, it was frightful. And I actually applied last year for, for a rain garden and I believe you came out I did. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I was, I was jumping the gun on it a little, and perhaps I've jumped it too much at this point. I, well, I, I know what I needed for tarps, and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and get these because with the COVID thing, there's so much stuff that isn't even available anymore. I mean, you think you're going to get things like you used to, and that doesn't happen. So I yeah. went and ordered them. I got them. They're here. Okay. So um, I. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe the, maybe I'm not going to be all that useful or something. I don't oh, know. no, I wouldn't say that at all. I think that um, if your plan is to do pollinator habitat, it's directly in line. And it sounds like the tarps that you got are for doing an organic establishment for Absolutely. site preparation. So you're thinking through all those steps. It's just, sometimes we like to have, we, we like to encourage people not to get started because like, let's use the rain garden example. Um, sometimes people will think they want to do a rain garden. They won't know where to site it and it turns out it might not actually be a good fit for their right. property and right. so that's why we kind of like people to hold off for the site mm -hmm. visit it's not that we're trying to incur stop people's enthusiasm <laughs> in any way um so so if you did put in an application i would say if if you were asking for reimbursement for tarps that you've already purchased for this project we would just want to make sure that they are appropriate that they're the right materials so johnny, that way it sets you up for success um, johnny, that's, that's johnny, johnny selected seeds um and their silage tarps and they are the 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 thing to do yes that's correct yeah. that's good All stuff right. Um, and so, yeah, so I would say in, in this situation, since we already even did a site visit with you, so you, um, we, you know, provided with some information already, then I would say, do feel free to put in the proposal. We would love to see it. Um, and it's, it's the, the site visit is really, we really do encourage it for new folks that we haven't met with, just so we can provide sort of um, a little guidance and make sure that um, we're all on the same page. Okay, great. Thank you. Actually, I think I need more information because uh, in my particular case, the the old farm that we're that we're thinking about, uh, Mother Nature has pretty much uh, taken it over as far as succession is concerned. The question is, uh, you know, can we do can we do some improvement on that? Uh, and right now, I would say that. Uh, I don't have the expertise, although I live in Groton, by the way, Mass, and we're working on one of those projects here, uh, where where they had an old an old orchard, and uh, I suppose I could work off what they're doing, but the, your timing seems a little short for what what I might have to put together. But uh, I'd be interested in certainly getting more information. Okay, Bob. Well, let's follow up after this, and we could have a conversation um, that's a, maybe a little more specific to your yep. property, mm -hmm. um, and we can see sort of what direction and goals you have, um, and, and, and sort of take it take it from there. Then it sounds like that that would be a good next step. Okay. Um, I'll put um, I'll put my phone number in the uh in the chat in case anybody wants to follow up with project specific questions so that's in there now so feel free to just give a call at any point it's my cell phone so it's easy to reach me Anyone else have any any questions about the program 
or suggestions for how we could improve it in the future, because I always want to hear from landowners about what they think would be a good use of resources. I, I have a suggestion um, that um, I visited uh, I visited Chris Snowman Shelley's and we visited with um, Laura Andrews and Carrie Gaunt and and I guess a suggestion would be to encourage applicants to or put you know connect with make the connection so that they could um, ask questions of people that have already done it that it was very helpful to do that oh so, good yeah yeah that's great and so we do list the folks that have had them on our website but we don't put their contact information um but that's something that we could do we could reach out to past awardees and see if they would be willing to share their contact information with current um grant seekers that's a great idea Dee. and also i have to go because i'm going i have another meeting i've got to get to but anyway Thank you so very much. This is great. Thanks, Dee. All right. Um, and we, we are going to be trying to start sharing more sort of case studies or success stories from our past grantees um, through the blogs on our website and newsletters. So um, if you aren't um, on our mailing list, let us know. We would be happy to add you so you can kind of keep in the loop with what's happening with the different grantees. And we've even, I believe we had um, in October, Laura and Carrie um, sort of focused on their property and the work they're doing through this grant program. Yeah. And after this call, what I can do, um, I can send out an email tomorrow with a copy of the PowerPoint slides, contact information to get in touch with Amanda. Um, and I'll make sure to include that uh, blog post because I think uh, it's a really great example of uh, what the Conservation Opportunity Fund can do. Um, and Laura and Carrie transformed, a, I would say, like a pretty good sized area in front of their house into some really beautiful pollinator habitat. And that's great, Minna. Thank you for doing that. And maybe the Zemans too. We could send the link to their blog. Another yeah. um, another um, awardee did an awesome blog capturing their whole process of going through this grant. And so it was, uh, I think it would be um, informative for folks. All right, well, if nobody has any other questions, um, that's sort of it. We just wanted to have sort of an informal chat and opportunity to answer questions. So um, I'll hang around for a few minutes. Um, and if anybody wants to chat further about their project, be happy to. Thank you. Appreciate Thank your you. time. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you all for your interest and for joining Thank us. You. Thank you guys. Thank you.